good afternoon. My name is Ilya Shapiro. I'm the director of the Robert A. Levy Center for Constitutional Studies here at Cato. And I'm delighted to uh, present here a forum about a uh, unique and innovative project in American constitutional law. An introduction to constitutional law, the name of the book, will teach you the narrative of con law as it's developed over the past two centuries by looking at the 100 most important cases uh, in really manageable descriptive <coughs> chunks. Uh, and there's more. There's an accompanying online video library on which I think the authors probably spent more time than writing the actual book. Uh, these videos are enriched by photographs, maps, audio excerpts of Supreme Court arguments. It's really a, a neat thing. Uh, more importantly, this multimedia work is accessible to everyone. You don't have to be a, a legal scholar, or law professor, or even a law student. High school student, uh, uh, homeschoolers, college students are just generally interested public. Uh, I think you'll be able to understand it all. Uh, law students, for that matter, can read and watch as they prepare for their law school exams. Uh, can, instead of binging Netflix, you can you know, binge uh, Josh and Randy. Um, so anyway, here to discuss this ambitious project are the authors, Randy Barnett, who is the Carmack Waterhouse Professor of Legal Theory at Georgetown University Law Center, and also a senior fellow at Cato, Josh Blackman, Associate Professor of Law at South Texas College of Law, Houston, and also an adjunct scholar at Cato. And here to comment are Judge Thomas Hardiman of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit, who was uh, on this very stage yesterday to give the uh, annual B. Kenneth Simon Lecture at our Constitution Day conference. And David Savage, the Supreme Court correspondent for the LA Times, and also no stranger to this stage. But you didn't come here to listen to me read their bios, and if you're uh, interested in this multimedia project, I'm sure you're capable of finding their bios online anyway. So um, without further ado, Randy and Josh, take it away. Thanks so much, and to Ilya for having us, and really uh, thanks to Tom and David for agreeing to be commentators and putting aside their busy schedule to read the book and, and offer their comments on it. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today. I look out and I see a lot of people who are sort of younger <coughs> students and a lot of people who are older folks. And so one of the things I'm curious to know from, and I take a show of hands, is uh, how many lawyers we have in the audience. So how many lawyers do we have in the audience? How many non-lawyers do we have? Okay. Good numbers. Good numbers. Good numbers. So uh, this is... Huh? Future, and hopefully maybe future lawyers. But, in the, the, but the more non-lawyers, the less you have to dumb down the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're not as corrupted, that's for sure. Um, so um, this is a book primarily um, for non-lawyers. Um, it is a, pr uh, a book primarily uh, for law students, uh, for, for as they're taking constitutional law, for college students who are interested in the Constitution and might be taking a course on it, for high school students, for homeschool students. Uh, it actually, the course the book plus the videos make a homeschool course. Um, and it's also for uh, folks who are not lawyers who are just interested in the Constitution. I know we tracked a lot of those here at Cato, uh, two of the programs that Cato has. And I take some of the other hands that were in the air that were not the uh, students in, uh, <coughs> raising your hands are people who are just interested in the Constitution. Um, and that's, this is a book for you. It's also a book for lawyers insofar as you may not remember your constitutional law class uh, or you may not have learned uh, some, much in your constitutional law class, which is typical of con law classes, I have to say, uh, because this book takes a different approach. And I want to describe the approach <coughs> we take, and then Josh is going to talk about the pedagogy of the book, something about the, called the flipped classroom, and I'm going to talk about um, the canonical approach to learning constitutional law. I'm a contracts professor as well as a constitutional law professor. I have a contracts case book. And the contracts, my contracts case book is organized around legal doctrine, doctrine that's coming either from the Uniform Commercial Code or is coming from the restatement of law of contracts, <coughs> or maybe it's coming from old cases. And you learn the rules, and then in my view, you should also learn the theory that underlies the rules so that you understand why we have the rules we have. And that's the best way of studying contract law. Um, constitutional law in the United States is a different animal than that. The Supreme Court does make doctrine, and they make doctrine that lower court judges, court of appeals judges like Tom Hardiman are obligated under the rules of stare decisis to follow. But the Supreme Court itself, when it comes to making decisions, <clears throat> kind of follows its own doctrine when it wants to. It changes its doctrine when it wants to. It disagrees about what the doctrine is when it wants to. This doctrine is not really driving the Supreme Court. What's driving the Supreme Court are 
underlying constitutional commitments that the justices have. And where do those commitments come from? They come from the history or narrative of the United States Constitution and the Supreme Court itself. The Supreme Court is a body that's been sitting in continuous session uh, for over 200 years. It cha its composition changes, uh, but the Supreme Court remains the same. And so there is an overarching narrative that's provided by the Supreme Court as a court. And the characters in that narrative, the characters in that story are the justices themselves. The ones that come, the ones that go, the ones that make a name for themselves, the ones you've never heard of. But there are, uh, there's another important set of characters in the story of constitutional law, and that is the cases. Which cases? Not every case. There's been hundreds and hundreds of cases. Most of them are obscure, deservedly obscure. No, it's a very small set, a handful of cases, which, are, which constitute what's called the canon, the constitutional canon. And what is the canon? The canon are the famous cases, the well-known cases famous to lawyers, famous to every constitutional practitioner, not the general public necessarily, but everyone who practices constitutional law knows these cases. They know these cases are the correct cases, the correctly decided cases, the cases to be emulated, the cases to be followed, the cases that you want your case, if you're litigating a case, like I litigated the medical marijuana case, you want your cases to be consistent with the canonical cases. And you want to paint your opponent's case as being inconsistent with the canonical cases. Because that is the intellectual furniture that the justices have in their own heads about how they decide cases. They want them to work out according to the right cases. And then there's the wrongly decided cases, which is also referred to as the anti-canon. These are the canon of cases that are famous for being wrong. Famous for being wrongly decided. These are the cases that you should not be emulating. That if your lawsuit if your theory sort of leads to the result of an anti-canonical case or is consistent with the method of an anti-canonical case, then you're going to lose that case. And you want to paint your opponent's <coughs> case as being like that. What are some of the most famous cases like that? Dred Scott, Plessy versus Ferguson. Or even a case like Lochner v. New York is in the anti-canon. I'm not going to talk much about Lochner, only that just the fact that it's in the anti-canon doesn't mean I agree that it should be in the anti-canon. I agree that Dred Scott and, and for Plessy should be in the anti-canon. I disagree that Lochner should be in the anti-canon, but it is in the anti-canon. And if you're going to learn constitutional law, you need to know which cases are which. The best, most efficient way of learning this is to learn how these cases were decided in historical context as the events unfolded. In other words, chronologically. How did these cases develop? Which cases rose, which cases fall? Some cases are in the canon, then they go into the anti-canon, or vice versa. And um, the best way to understand this story is to understand it as a story, and that's the story that this book tells. It is the overarching narrative of constitutional law, the overarching story of constitutional law, which consists of the individual stories of each of these famous cases. And that's how we're organized. Now, it does divide this story into two parts. Part one is the story of the canon with respect to <laughs> constitutional structure. How sh the three branches of government, separation of powers, federalism, those cases. That's one story. Then it has a second story about constitutional rights. Um, that's part two. And how do those develop? It just so happens that in the overarching narrative of constitutional law, the structural cases dominate the early part of our history, and the rights cases dominate the later part of our history. So even dividing it into parts one and parts two still maintains some degree of overarching chronological narrative, but it's not, strictly speaking, uh, um, uh, consistently uh, uh, one continuous story. Anyway, our book provides the most in fact, there's no other book on the market like it, no other book that's been published that's like it. Our book provides the story of each one of these cases, which means the facts of each one of these cases, what the court tried to do in each one of these cases, and how that case fits into the broader narrative that is the modern practice of constitutional law. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to my co-author, uh, Josh Blackman. The way, the pro this way this project came about um, was that I invited Josh to be a part of my casebook. My casebook is organized this way. Um, I, 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 I wanted him on the casebook because I know he's an academic uh, promoter and he would figure out a way to sell more casebooks. And then he came at me with I his hustle. and he came out at me with this idea, let's do a video series. 
I thought that was a good idea. Little did I know how much work it was involved. Two years of real hard work scripting it and filming it. Um, and then what, what, it turned out that our work product was just too important to be limited to people who use our casebook. And that's when we decided to make a separate volume for everybody else who doesn't use our casebook to both read about it um, and to watch it in this series of videos that Josh is about to tell you about. And this is one of the rare instances that probably defies my general principle that uh, PowerPoint is unconstitutional, at least as applied in 90% of the cases. I think this is one of the 10%. This is powerful, not PowerPoint, okay? This is, <laughs> this, this is very good. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. I see many friends and familiar faces and faces I don't know. Please, afterwards, introduce yourselves. We'll be signing copies of the book. We also have these book plates to sign. If you can't get a copy <clears throat> today, we will be happy to sign one for you if you say you will buy the book online. Um, this project is designed to talk to a different generation of students. Um, I see a lot of students here. Uh, students acquire information differently today than they did a generation ago. The traditional model of learning is you get this big, thick book at the start of the semester. You're assigned 20 or 30 pages. You come to class, and then you talk about what, what you read. And most of what you read is just drilling out the basic facts of a case, what you read. And there's maybe a little bit of time to actually discuss <coughs> at the end. That model of learning is quickly becoming, I think, obsolete. Um, the newer approach and the approach used in primary and secondary education is what's called the flipped classroom. What does that mean? You flip the sequence with which you learn. Rather than having the same repetitive lecture in class, you flip that to home. That is, you watch the basic lecture on your <clears> own <throat> to get the facts and basic understanding of the case. And when you come to class, you can leapfrog over a lot of that material and get to the core of what teachers do, which is help you understand the why. The what you can do at home. The why is what you do in school. And this book is designed, it's geared for the flipped classroom. We wrote it for law students, but we kept the language such as college students, advanced high school students, homeschool students, and a wide range of markets can utilize this project. And I want to show a brief clip from one of the videos. Now, this is a video that's very near and dear to Randy's heart. It's a case called Gonzalez versus Raich. Uh, Randy argued this case before the Supreme Court in 2005, and it considered whether the federal government can prohibit locally grown marijuana. I got your attention, right? Uh, locally grown marijuana. Now, now, now they're listening, right? Um, now, the reason why this video series is important is we're able to bring you into the Supreme Court. We have the audio from the Supreme Court oral argument. We have the justices talking <coughs> about the cases in their own words. No book will give that to you. Let me play this clip, and I'll give you some commentary afterwards. Um, this is just a two minute clip. I won't play the entire thing. The whole thing lends about 15. This had already rejected any theory of enumerated powers that lacked a limiting principle. During oral argument, some of the justices seem open to the market substitute theory. Justice David Souter, suggested that whether or not an activity was economic depends on whether it had an economic effect on the national economy. He then equated the economic effect on the interstate market of Angel and Diane's homegrown marijuana with that of Roscoe Filburn's homegrown wheat. If there would be a large market effect, it makes no more sense to call this non-economic than Filburn's use. To this, I responded that Lopez and Morrison stood for the proposition that the mere fact that activities may have an economic effect on the market does not make them economic activities. To identify whether an activity is economic, you have to look to the activity itself. But an economic activity is one that's associated with sale, exchange, barter, the production of things for sale and exchange, barter. So for example, you, prostitution is an economic activity. Marital relations is not an economic activity. We could be talking about virtually the same act. 
We don't say that because there is a market for prostitution, that therefore everything that has an effect on the market, because it substitutes for what can be obtained in the market, is itself economic activity. <clears throat> After this exchange, the justices drop the market substitute conception of economic activity. Ultimately, the court ruled for the government by a vote of six to three. The four progressive justices were joined by two of the conservative justices from the Lopez and Morrison majority, Justices Kennedy and Scalia. In his majority opinion, Justice Stevens did not adopt the government's market substitute. All right, that's all you can get for now. Um, funny, right? That's exactly why we did this. The Supreme Court's cases are not simple. They are not straightforward. They include colorful characters, uh, fun narratives, intricate doctrine, complicated precedents, and conflicting reasoning. And this project distills all that into a fun 10-minute video that a student can watch in the metro on the way to class. And that's why I wrote this book. Let me briefly walk you through the chronology of these cases. Um, there are about a hundred of them, and they begin with the Jay Court. Chief Justice John Jay, one of the authors of the Federalist, was one of the first justices on the court. And they decide the case of Chisholm versus Georgia, which you may have never heard of. This was one of the first <coughs> major Supreme Court cases about the power of federal courts to hear suits against a state. Can a state be sued? The Marshall Court, which I'm sure you've all heard of, was from Chief Justice John Marshall. Marvin v. Madison, the power of judicial review. McCulloch v. Maryland, the power of Congress to regulate interstate commerce and the necessary and proper clause. Gibbons v. Ogden, can Congress regulate boats moving between states? And Barron v. Baltimore, did the Bill of Rights apply to the states? We move on to the period before, during, and after the Civil War in the Tawny Court. Prigg versus Pennsylvania involved the Fugitive Slave Act. Dred Scott v. Sanford, the anti-canonical case, considered whether people of African descent could ever be citizens. And ex parte Merriman, could the executive suspend the writ of habeas corpus and lock a person up without any judicial process? Following the Civil War, we have the court of Chief Justice Salmon Chase, one of Randy's icons. And here the court grappled with the scope of Congress's powers to regulate local activity. In DeWitt, the court said Congress cannot regulate the sale of oil. In Hepburn, legal tender, paper money, was declared unconstitutional. But a year, a year later, Knox versus Lee, the court said, no, no, paper money is just fine. In Slaughterhouse and Bradwell, the court took this new provision of the Constitution the Privileges or Immunities Clause, and reduce it to a nullity. The Waite Court was in the late 1870s and 1880s, had cases involving civil rights, some good, some not so good. Strouder said that a jury cannot be segregated, and Nick Woe said that a permits cannot be denied to Asian people in San Francisco. But the civil rights cases was a huge decision which said that Congress does not have the power to prevent discrimination in places of public accommodation. Congress would not try another civil rights law for nearly 100 years after that. We move on to the progressive era in the early 1900s about the power of both the state and the federal government to regulate <coughs> labor conditions. In E.C. Knight and in Lochner, the court held that certain labor laws were unconstitutional. But in Champion versus Ames and Muller, the court upheld various labor laws. And of course, in the same time, with the anti-canonical case of Plessy versus Ferguson, which upheld a separate but equal doctrine. We move on to the White Court, which sat primarily during World War I. We had a number of cases involving the rights of free speech. Could you be punished for criticizing the government? In Schenck and Debs and Abrams, the answer was yes, you can. The Taft Court, in the run-up, to World War II had some cases involving substantive due process. Was there a right to raise your own children? Was there a right to direct your children's education? Myvery, Nebraska, and Pierce, the Society of Sisters, said yes. Then we have a case that's in very firmly in the anti-canon, Buck v. Bell. This decision upheld a compulsory sterilization law of so-called imbeciles, an awful, awful decision. 
We move on to the era before the New Deal, where the court gradually expanded how much power the federal government had. In cases like Schechter Poultry, the court said, no, 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 Congress, you cannot regulate the sale of local chickens. But in other cases like NLRB versus Jones and Laughlin Steel and Darby, the court said, yes, you can. You can go after local transactions. And it was really here that the administrative state exploded. This was the turning point during the 1930s. Move on to World War II with a case like Korematsu, also firmly in the anti-canon, which upheld the power of the federal government to detain people based solely on their nationality. But the biggest changes in the century came during the court known as the Warren Court. Chief Justice Earl Warren presided for barely 15 years, but we had a revolution in constitutional law with civil rights and equality in cases like Brown versus Board of Education and Cooper against Aaron. We have cases involving free exercise of religion with Sherbert versus Verner. Freedom of speech, the right to criticize public officials in New York Times versus Sullivan. Of course, Grizzle v. Connecticut recognized a right to constitutional privacy to have contraceptives. And U.S. v. O'Brien said you can burn your draft card, but you get in trouble if you do so. <laughs> Move on to the Burger Court, which was decided in the 1970s. Of course, the biggest case there was Roe v. Wade, the abortion decision. But there were also cases involving affirmative action, Bakke, as well as takings of private property in Penn Central. The biggest chunk of our book, probably a quarter of it, was from the latter part of the 20th century, the court of Chief Justice William H. Rehnquist. This was a federalism revolution about the power of the state governments to regulate what the states are doing. The court held in cases <clears throat> like New York versus United States and, and Prince versus United States that Congress cannot issue dire directives, commands to states. And in Lopez and Morrison, the court held that uh, 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 Congress cannot regulate non-economic activity. All well and good, but then we get to 2005 with Randy's case, Gonzalez versus Raich, where the court broadened the scope of what economic activity is it gave Congress a very wide latitude to go after local activity. <clears throat> In the same time, we have Lawrence v. Texas, which is a right to uh, homosexual sodomy, and McConnell v. FEC, which is rights of free speech and campaign finance. And of course, a case we know all too well, Kilo versus City of New London, about the power of the government to take private property for giving it to some wealthy corporation. I'm only slightly exaggerating. Finally, we move on to the current court. The Roberts Court, where we are now. Start off pretty good with D.C. v. Heller, which involved the right to keep and bear arms for personal use. McDonald v. Chicago, the right to bear arms against the state. But then things go a little bit downhill. Another case, Randy and I know too well, which is NFIB v. Sibelius, which upheld the Affordable Care Act. <coughs> U.S. v. Windsor, which declared the Defense of Marriage Act unconstitutional. A Burgerfell v. Hodges, which recognized the right to same-sex marriage. At our most recent cases, Fisher versus United States of uh, University of Texas, an affirmative action case, and Holman's Health versus Hellerstedt, which is an abortion decision. Uh, the canon ends here for now, but it will no doubt expand. Cases come and go. Our project here was basically download my brain and Randy's brain to a book and then give it to all of you so we yeah, distill right now. everything we know. And we hope this will be a valuable resources for students, professors, teachers, judges, Reporters, people make bad puns. I mean, uh, think tank scholars and uh, uh, friends everywhere. Thank you all so much, and uh, I welcome our discussion later. Thank you. I just want to add one thing to what Josh said. If you look at the icons that are, represent each case, you'll notice there's a photograph <coughs> or a graphic. This is just a teaser of what the videos are like. Josh is the one that's solely responsible for having identified and selected all of these pictures, all of these clips, all of these audios. It is a Herculean task on his part. Uh, he and I co-wrote the scripts. We both went into the studio. We were in the studio for something like 80 hours over two years. Uh, we went over, the, we edited, but he is the one that's responsible for storyboarding this out and making sure they're illustrated. And all of those beautiful pictures that you saw just illustrate how each one of those videos um, has great graphics to <coughs> show you who the people were and where they were. And there's also a lot of illustrations showing about uh, illustrating the basic doctrines. Thank so, you. Now, so now we know why the picture for NFIB is Josh's book yes. on the Obamacare litigation. Yes, it was unprecedented.
Yes, we know that. <laughs> All right. Uh, By the way, who wrote the foreword to that book? All right. <laughs> it's on my bookshelf. Uh, Judge. Okay. Okay. That's fine. Well, let me. Uh, I just want to echo what a number of people said. This is a terrific book. Um, I recommend it highly. It's um, it's quite a, an achievement to take a hundred cases and and describe them clearly and concisely. You know, there's a lot written on a lot of Supreme, but they have clear, concise uh, descriptions of the cases. I think they're chosen well. So I'd recommend it to anybody, uh, students who are young and not so young, if you want to read about the history of the Supreme Court. I must say, though, in going through it, uh, like any good work, it caused me to think and have questions. And they don't go to what um, they have written about. It's the thought of what the Constitution says and what the Supreme Court has done over time. In the um, index, there are three, only three cases on executive power. And I think that's actually a fairly um, good representation of what the Supreme Court has done over the years. So if you had to say, which is the greater threat to a democracy, to a, a constitutional government? Is it a elected House, Senate, and President who sort of go off the deep end, or a parliament in Britain and does something really out of line? Or is it an unchecked executive? But if you said, how many cases are there in the Supreme Court's history that have put checks on the executive power? There are very few. Uh, a couple of days ago, I happened to be in the car this weekend. You, you know, there was uh, some drone attack in, in Saudi Arabia. And the president put out a statement that said something like, locked and loaded depending on verification. <laughs> now, you know what that means. He's threatening what we use the phrase military action. Now, if you looked at the Constitution, if you're a close student or not, you'd read the Constitution and think, wait a minute, can the president do that? Can the president on his own launch some war? Well, I guess the answer is yes. The Supreme Court's never said otherwise. And I find that sort of surprising. I can explain it. All, all the years they've said there has to be a case in controversy. But they've stayed away from any, they've never made any such um, statement to that effect. Saying the, the, <laughs> we would think it was sort of quaint if the president had put out a statement saying, you know, if the evidence comes back in, against Iran, I may go to Congress and ask for a declaration of war. <laughs> Doesn't that sound sort of old, old fashioned? You can't fit that in a tweet. <laughs> yeah, that probably wouldn't fit in a tree. Can the president on his own spend money for something that Congress has refused to appropriate money for? I would have thought if you'd read the Constitution, the answer is no. It says no money shall be. But um, we saw an interesting demonstration of the contrary in, in this year. Remember, the president wanted some, I forget the number, eight or seven billion dollars for a border wall. The House said no. There was a so-called partial government shutdown. At the end of the shutdown, uh, they agreed on some deal, but it didn't include the money the president wanted. So a few days later, he said, I'm declaring a national emergency under some mid 19th century, and I'm going to transfer a couple billion dollars from the military budget, and I'm going to spend it on the wall. I don't care whether you people in, in Congress agree with that or not. And he did. Uh, there was a lawsuit brought, uh, a judge issued an injunction, predictably in Northern California, a national injunction saying, don't do that. The Ninth Circuit upheld that. Well, a, a couple in mid-July, on a Friday night, I remember it well, on a Friday evening in late July, the Supreme Court issued a five to four order based on an emergency uh, appeal from the Solicitor General, no reasoning, no majority opinion, no dissent saying, yes, we're lifting that the, the president can go ahead and spend that money. And that will be the law through the end of, um, for the foreseeable future, because the cases are percolating. Along. So anyway, I come away thinking, wow, uh, there are a lot of areas where, it's interesting, uh, Britain is going through a version of this same situation right now. You know, you would have thought, can the prime minister shut down the parliament? 
during a, a contentious time and sort of seemingly on political basis so he can negotiate it. And I think a lot of people in Britain said, well, you can't do that. But, you know, we could sit on this side of the Atlantic saying, oh, that's poor Brits. They don't have a written constitution like we do. And, and, and they don't have a Supreme Court that's used to deciding cases like that. But, you know, there is some sort of case I've been reading about is in the, the Supreme Court. Uh, and um, I don't know how they're going to decide it. But it seems like they're going to decide it. If the same thing happens on this side of the Atlantic, if two weeks from now the president launches a um, now, we're talking uh, hypotheticals here, launches some war in the Mideast, and the House, members of the House say, you can't do that. Uh, we didn't authorize this war. The president would say, oh, go pound salt. I'm going to do what you want. If they would then bring some sort of lawsuit to try to stop it under a part of the Constitution that says the court can decide controversies involving the United States, we all know the court would say, oh, you don't have standing, or uh, this is a political question. We don't decide that. So anyway, I came away thinking, <laughs> uh, this book is a very good, clear, concise view of what the Supreme Court has done over time on deciding cases among the Constitution. But I also say, when I come to read it, I think, wow, there are whole aspects of the Constitution where I'm not confident the Supreme Court has done a very good job of enforcing and interpreting what the Constitution actually says. Also a paucity of Third Amendment cases, I think. <laughs> We do not have a chapter in the Third Amendment. Well, there'll, um, be, there'll be 101 cases. You know, as you were speaking there, that made me think. I, I'm sure President Trump would love to be able to prorogue Congress. Uh, oh my gosh. Um, but how, how do you, how do we define executive power, though? That, in your view, that doesn't include executive branch agencies. Well, I'm. Uh, I'm there are a lot of cases in there that involve executive power that, I would that don't deal with what the president him. Self says in yeah, I'm only relying on, I mean, they talk about Youngstown, you know, the great constitutional cases, but go. Yeah, we cover Noel Canning, which is sort of an executive power. Mm -hmm. recently, but when we say executive power, we mean Article 2, not some sort of delegated power from, the, from Congress and the executive branch to regulate us. Uh, what about Senate. Chevron? Yeah. Not to Chevron. Uh. Not to Chevron. Is that an... Intentional omission. Uh, well, let me talk about this. I mean, if, you know, one, one of the difficulties of any time you say, you know, the 100 best movies of all time or the 100 cases you should know, you run the risk of uh, having a lot of smart people say, ah, oh, they left out these 17 cases. Before you answer, let me just, I should have mentioned this earlier. I'm not setting my fantasy football lineup here. I'm checking the hashtag Cato Scotus. So any of you watching this on live stream, again, the multimedia, up-to-date, you know, new student kind of era, uh, or for that matter, any of you in the auditorium, you're welcome to tweet questions at me. Just use hashtag or comments. Use hashtag Cato Scotus. Anyway. Uh, you know, judges ask questions. That's what they do. So I will answer his honor's <laughs> question. They don't like talking to ask, like, ask questions. Uh, it's a good question, Your Honor. Um, we had a very tough time picking cases. And let me tell you something. We did not start out thinking, what are the 100 cases? That wasn't our plan at all. We simply put a list together of cases we thought that were worth studying. And at the end, we had 103. It was completely accidental. I said, wow, a great book would be 100 cases. So I sort of called the list a little bit. Uh, but we, ex we, we excluded stuff. What did we exclude? Nothing in criminal procedure. We needed the Fourth, Fifth, or Sixth Amendments. Mm -hmm. Miranda, Terry v. Ohio, these sorts of very significant cases we just did not include. Uh, we didn't include stuff on the federal court's jurisdiction, which is very significant. Right? When can the federal courts actually hear a case? We dabble a little bit. Um, we didn't talk about things like the Dormant Commerce Clause, which is very important. Uh, the Contracts Clause, which was very significant in the early years of the Republic. Uh, uh, we didn't do death penalty, Eighth Amendment cases, or cruel and unusual punishment. Um, we didn't do voting rights cases, which were also very significant. Uh, there were a lot of topics we just did not cover altogether. Um, this is only meant to be, as the title indicates, an introduction to constitutional law. Uh, but we tried to pick the case, if you read these 100, you will now be fluent in just about any conversation of common law. 
The other thing I should add is that, as I said in the beginning, the origin of this project was in um, my casebook, and now it's Josh in my casebook. This is a ca these are casebooks that are used to teach constitutional law. At Georgetown, we have divided up the constitutional law classes between Con Law 1, which is structure, Con Law 2, which is rights, and the casebook reflects that. And then the casebook uh, decision of what to cover in the casebook uh, is based on what you can realistically cover in a one semester Con Law 1 class, what you can realistically cover in a one semester Con Law 2 class. Um, and so that requires making hard choices. And there are certain topics that are just not taught in your basic constitutional law class almost anywhere, like criminal procedure is taught in a separate class, uh, federal courts is taught in a separate class. So because they're not covered by the casebook, they're not, they don't, they're not covered by our videos either, although there are things in the casebook, like the Dormant Commerce Clause, that are covered in the casebook and are not covered in this book, uh, partly on the grounds that it, 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 it gets very technical. Um, and we really do mean this to be accessible to a broader audience, and that just seemed like it was just a little too much uh, for a book like this. Well, I think the accessibility is it, perhaps its chief virtue among the many virtues of the book. And I have to reluctantly agree with what Josh said about the multimedia presentation. I'm, I'm dating myself, but when I... Uh, learned in college, you know, we were taught in our great books program that you're not going to read Plato on Homer, you're going to read Homer. You're not going to read Aristotle on Plato, you're going to read Aristotle and so on and so forth. The, the, the method was insistent upon reading the most important things that had ever been written by taking the authors at face value, <coughs> primary sources. And I still feel that way about law. Uh, you know, you shouldn't read uh, a 20th century legal scholar on Blackstone. You should, you know, it's available, you know, got it in my chambers. Read Blackstone. Um, I feel the same way about Supreme Court decisions. And when I teach advanced constitutional law, I force my students to read every word of every case that we yeah. study. That includes concurrences and dissents. Well, I have the luxury of doing that because I teach a third year seminar. As anybody who's been to law school knows, there is so much packed into that curriculum that at some level it's, it's a survey course. And uh, the case books themselves, no matter whether they have 800 or 1200 single space pages, there's a lot missing in those case books. There are ellipses everywhere. And I remember reading, you know, you read Marbury v. Madison, and you're all excited, and you think, wow, this is great. And they only give you a tiny sliver of the case because you have to get through the material. So when I took a look at, at this book, the thing that was most striking to me was if you have any intellectual curiosity at all about the law or the Constitution or American history, this is incredibly accessible and I think will provoke most people who are curious in any of those areas, not just constitutional law, to delve more deeply. And, um, you know, it's simply, I've, we have three children, one of them's here today, and I've seen firsthand, they do learn differently. The, this generation learns differently. And these videos, I got to, to watch many of them, uh, these videos are going to draw people in. Uh, it, I mean, it drew me in, and I'm over 50, so I, I can only imagine how it's going to draw in uh, really thoughtful high school students and college students. And, and that's, uh, for those of us who care deeply about the Constitution, who work with the Constitution every day, anything that gets the public more engaged with the Constitution is a wonderful thing. My question is, you, both of you sort of chose not to criticize the uh, court's decision. You, you report them, you explain them, but you don't directly say, this doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, it's, you just read my mind. I, was, I had just raised my hand to say something about that. Um, because this is a book uh, that we would like law professors who disagree with us to recommend that their students um, uh, use. And in fact, we have endorsements for many, many prominent left of center law professors for the book. And a foreword by Dean Erwin Chemerinsky uh, of uh, Bald Hall School of Law wrote the foreword for the book. Uh, we really wanted to be fair and accurate. 
so that they couldn't believe that we hid the ball or that we skewed the cases anyway. Having said that, as Michael Dorff in his um, comment, his blurb says, we do introduce our views at junctures about where we think the court uh, is internally inconsistent or whether what they said in this case doesn't quite line up with what they said in the previous case. Um, and so we don't typically criticize the court for failing to be originalist. I mean, there's, we do have some videos which cover the original meaning of the Privilege or Immunities Clause briefly. Uh, so this is not an originalist book. Uh, so we don't really make that criticism that they got it wrong. But we do make criticisms about how their reasoning may not cohere or why the dissent might have the better of the argument. Uh, you, you, you will get somewhat of our perspective through the, as maybe especially through the videos. Um, uh, as opposed to the book. But I, it, it is there. It's just, it has to be muted in a way that will not put off people who have different views than we do. Well, I thought your comments on the Rage case were very muted because it was your case and I thought he should win and he lost. <laughs> I remember the argument. The court had said in 1995 that in the Lopez case that mere gun possession in a school zone was not commerce. You know, there was some federal law of uh, guns. It's, they said it's just gun possession. It's not buying, it's a mere gun possession is not commerce. Well, then Randy has a case where a, a sick woman living in California grows marijuana in her backyard or in another patient who's given to her. And medical marijuana is legal in California. So how is it that backyard homegrown marijuana is commerce? And I th Randy brought that case to the Supreme Court. I thought, well, that's a good case. You ought to win. And he lost. <laughs> that some of the justices, including Justice Scalia and Kennedy, who were said gun possession was not commerce, found a way to say that marijuana in your backyard is commerce, even though everybody agreed she didn't buy it, she didn't sell it, it wasn't going on any market. And then flip forward to their famous case, the healthcare case. I would have thought, wow, uh, I would have thought that regulating insurance, saying you have to provide whatever it is uh, in regard to pre-existing, which sure sounded like commerce. Now, I realize there was a, a mandate question, but the Supreme Court said gun possession is not commerce, backyard marijuana is commerce, <laughs> regulating health care, four of them were willing to, I guess five of them said, no, no, that's not commerce. And I would have thought, that's an interesting uh, collection of <laughs> views on what is and is not commerce. But then we explain the reasoning of the court that distinguishes those three cases from each other. I, I, there's one other point I want to make that, that, that David's question brings up, and that is in the Rach case, we, you saw on the screen that we got uh, three votes. On behalf of, Sorry. On behalf of uh, uh, the users of medical marijuana, who were our three votes? Conservative Chief Justice Rehnquist, Conservative Clarence Thomas, and Conservative uh, Sandra Day O'Connor. Those right. were our three votes. Right. We lost Justice Scalia. We lost Justice Kennedy. But who, which votes did we not ever even have a chance of getting? It was the progressive justices on the court, the left side of the court. Now, you would think if you were a kind of unsophisticated legal realist who thinks that judges just act politically to get the uh, results that they like, you would think that the left side of the court would like the results. It's a marijuana case. It's out of California. It's a Ninth Circuit case. Um, it had, we had sympathetic uh, parties. We had sick women. Um, and we were arguing pretty much on behalf of other sick people, um, who had ke cancer patients who were taking chemotherapy. We had all the facts that we would, should want to appeal to the left side of the court, and yet we never had a shot. And I think David will agree. We never had a shot at the left side of the court. This is a book about why that's true. And it this was, is, a, is it because Justice Ginsburg is against the little guy? This is, uh, uh, oh God, Ellie. This, this, is, this is a book about how these justices operate with a larger picture in their heads, a larger narrative, and where they fit into the narrative. And our case did not fit into the progressive narrative of broad federal power, um, that was going to be constrained only by enumerated rights or by a suspect classification or something like that. We didn't fit into the picture of the Constitution they carried in their head. And they put their commitment to constitutional principle, their constitutional principles, ahead of their compassion 
for the sick and the dying. This is the opinion which, which which not in the video, by the way. Which, which at some <laughs> level you kind of have to admire, that they put their principled commitments ahead of their compassion. Uh, but this is a book to understand how that's be, and how Supreme Court litigators know this is the case. Before they go into court, they know who they can have a shot at and who they don't. It's the story the justices carry in their heads that explains this, not the doctrine. Let me play another brief clip. We developed a timeline to illustrate how the Supreme Court's doctrines fluctuated along the lines, David. So let me play this clip for a few seconds. And has now spoken. Let's conclude by returning to our brief history of implied powers. Lopez and Morrison represented an effort. Lopez was the gun case that David mentioned. To put the brakes on any further expansion of New Deal and Warren Court doctrines governing implied federal powers. Now, Congress could only regulate intrastate activity having a substantial effect on interstate commerce if the activity was economic in nature. Then, in Raich, Raich was the marijuana case Randy did. By allowing Congress to reach even non-economic activity as part of a broader regulatory scheme, the court seemed to allow Congress to go beyond the high watermark established by the New Deal court in Wickard. So here we put basically 80 years of Supreme Court precedent in a single graphic. However, in NFIB versus Sebelius, the court That's the Obamacare case. was not willing to extend Congress's powers beyond the regulation of economic and non-economic activity to the regulation of inactivity. This was not a repudiation of the New Deal. Rather, the Chief Justice stuck with the Rehnquist Court's stance of this far and no farther without a judicially administrable limiting principle. In other words, the court would not go beyond the line it had drawn in Wickard and then extended in Raich. So this graphic shows in basically one sentence the answer to David's question, right? How do you reconcile 80 odd years of precedent on implied federal powers. Why guns, yes, marijuana, no. Why yes to uh, 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 healthcare, but not to pot. We try to synthesize a very complicated story that we take for granted in a way that anyone, anyone, I mean that, can get this in about 10 minutes to watch this video. Can I make one more point? Of course you can. Uh, the way we were able to successfully formulate our healthcare challenge. Um, on Commerce Clause and Necessary and Proper Clause grounds depended on our understanding of what the Supreme Court had really said. And what, there's a difference between what the Supreme Court has really said about a lot of things and what law professors say they said and how law professors teach that subject. Um, I believe that lower courts are bound by what the Supreme Court has said, but I think they're only bound by what the Supreme Court has actually said. They're not bound by what law professors have extrapolated from what the Supreme Court has said to some greater principle. And that's so, my emphasis for primary sources. Right. So, and I think that's absolutely right. What's so, a good, what's this a is good a good example this, of that. Huh? What's a good? You've you've got something in mind. What's a good example of that, Randy, for the audience of uh, where law professors will take some broad principle and assert that it's the law even though it's sort of an extrapolation. Right. So for example, they will say that the New <coughs> Deal basically said that Congress has a plenary power to regulate anything that in Congress's opinion represents a national problem, mm. um, and particularly when it comes to the economy. And in fact, that was a theory that was uh, on offer at the time that Wickard versus Filburn was decided. And there was an internal debate, which our book in the case book discusses. There was an internal debate as, uh, as to whether the court should be candid and accept that proposition. And at the end of the day, they couldn't bite the bullet and do that. So they never said what that, they never uh, announced that Congress has a plenary power unreviewable by the courts to regulate the national economy. They never said that. Now, law professors have interpreted what they did as though they had said that. So when you hit a case like um, NFIB versus Sibelius, you would say, well, Congress is regulating the national economy. They have a plenary power to regulate the national economy. And therefore, this is an easy case. Well, it's not an easy case if you go by what they actually said. And the same thing was true. This is how the Rehnquist court went this far, established a this far and no farther line in Lopez and Morris. And they said, look, in the past, we have never allowed Congress to reach inside a state and regulate wholly intrastate activity if that activity is non-economic. Now, the truth is <laughs> that the court had never previously made a distinction between economic and non-economic. Hmm. But they had also not said, and you can regulate everything. And what Rehnquist Court did is they looked back and they said, if we look at all the cases we've decided, we never went that far, and now we're not going to go that far 
unless you can do so without, uh, and provide us with a limiting principle. So in order to litigate, you sometimes need to focus on what the Supreme Court has really said, even if it's wrong, as opposed to what the law professors would like them to have said. And I would urge lower court justices, judges to do the same. That is, they're bound by stare decisis, but they're not bound by, by, to draw an extrapolation from what the court has said off into the never, land, never, never lands about what the government may or may not do. They should, be, they should stick with the ratio dissidenti of actual cases. A absolutely, and, and we, I'd like to think we do that. I know I try to do that every day. We, we have a lot of uh, moments in conference when the three judges on the panel on our court are conferencing cases, and we'll talk about the case at hand, and a judge will make a point along the lines Randy just discussed, and another judge in the conference will say, that's the next case. And that's really an important self-limiting principle on judicial power, is to make sure you're deciding the case or controversy in front of you, not deciding the next case. Um, it's not always honored, but I think it's an important principle. I want to add one other thing in response to David's question and, and Randy's comment. And this comes up a lot when I teach my class. The answer, I think, to David's question as to how this happens is the facts matter. And I was glad to see Van Orden v. Perry and McCurry County versus ACLU. These are two Ten Commandments cases decided on the same day. In one case, the Ten Commandments is okay on the state capitol grounds in Austin, Texas, but the Ten Commandments display inside the McCreary County Courthouse was invalidated. And of course, my students look at that and say, well, what's going on here? How can, the, how can this be? Well, the short answer is Justice Breyer went one way in one case and the other way in the other. A um, longer answer is the facts matter. And there was an extensive record in the McCreary County case about a back and forth between the government trying to make this display constitutional, even after they had a lot of um, comments that could be deemed proselytizing, whereas that was a different record. It's led other people to, in a, in a somewhat an uncharitable way, to say, well, that's the inside-outside rule. As long as it's outside, the commandments are okay. <laughs> if they're indoors, they're not okay. I think it has to be old and outside. Well, that's the, well we've got an, yeah, a new doctrine now with the, the Bladensburg Cross case, because that was the first outside well, that's an outside display that, that, that was also okay. But the, the rationale of the Supreme Court in that case made clear that it's not an outside-inside thing. It's age, longevity has something to do with it. Um, but I think this, this book and the, the videos, when you tell the stories about the people involved, that highlights the principle that I make to my students again and again, which is the facts matter when you tell these stories. But they don't always matter, as Randy just said, because sometimes if we assume, I don't know, I, I, didn't, I wasn't involved in the case, but if we assume that Raich was the sympathetic party, the facts didn't matter enough to break through that principle that Randy just articulated was more important to the justices that ruled against Randy's case. But in many, many other cases, the facts matter enough that you see some significant doctrinal shift or perhaps an even contradiction from where the court was heading. I'm glad you included both of those cases. And I'm glad you struggled a little bit, Judge, to explain it to your students, because I remember that. I, I, I was doing a, a radio program for NPR that, that year, and uh, I remember I went down, and, and there were, the court was hearing two arguments on the Ten Commandments. So I was on for about 10 minutes to talk about the, you know, the courts hearing these cases to decide can you have the Ten Commandments monuments on public land, or does that violate the First Amendment? So then I was invited to come back in late June, the day they decided the case, and, and the moderator says, wait a minute, there are two cases, and they, one says this and one says that, and, and I had about five minutes to try to explain, well, you know, you know that it was entirely Justice Breyer, and he had this view, it's not a... Um, it's, it's a fairly smart view. The court just used it in this Maryland case a couple of months ago, which is if some county officials are trying to make a public statement by putting up these religious symbols and sort of making it a big deal, that, that seems like it's the government making a 
public statement about religion and we shouldn't allow that. But in the case, this monument, granite monument, had been sitting on the grounds of the Texas State Capitol for more than 40 years. I think almost no one even knew that it was there. There were like 20 or 25 other monuments. And some homeless guy brought this lawsuit saying he was offended by this 10 command. And, and in that case, I think Breyer was quite right to say, do we really want to tear up on county courthouses all around the country tear up old monuments or cover over Moses if, if he's painted on some mural, that it was a correct, correct view that as a matter of judgment and the facts, we shouldn't do it. But as a matter of pure legal, um, legal doctrine, it wasn't very easy to explain. I was at a seminar in Pittsburgh uh, before that case was decided, and we had a lot of really smart lawyers from Pittsburgh in the room. And every single lawyer at that seminar thought, both cases were going to come out the same way. No one was quite sure which way. There was only one lawyer that predicted they would come out differently, and that lawyer predicted correctly, and that was the only lawyer in the room who had argued cases in the Supreme Court. Huh. Well, one other thing is that if Justice Thomas's interpretation of the Establishment Clause is correct, then none of these cases are rightly decided because the Establishment Clause did not actually protect an individual right, which would then be one of the privileges or immunities of citizens protected by the 14th Amendment or properly incorporated under modern doctrine into the Due Process Clause. And therefore, there's a, there should be a free exercise claims that could be the Supreme Court and lower courts could hear, but not any Establishment Clause came. So, so this whole area of law that we've been talking about would probably not exist if Justice Thomas's interpretation of the original meaning of the Establishment Clause is right. And that just shows that that's not what our book is about. Our, our, book, our, book, is, our book is about, um, and Akhil also thinks that, Akhil Amar does. Our, our book is about what has the Supreme Court done? What is constitutional law in this country? Not whether it's all correctly decided as compared with the actual original meaning of the text of the con uh, Constitution. And I'm not saying that Justice Thomas or Akhil Amar are right about the Establishment Clause, but they have a very powerful argument. And if they are right, then none of the stuff we've just been debating really ought to be in the federal courts at all. And of course, Gorsuch in the Cross case said that there's an issue with standing. Just because you're an offended observer, you shouldn't he be able to- Use word offended, yes. only, that triggers people. Don't use word offended. It's very, it's very inconsiderate, David. Before I open it up, uh, I, got, I did to uh, audience questions and further discussion uh, in that regard. Uh, I did get a question over Twitter from Trevor Burris, uh, the editor of the Supreme Court who's Review. Who's upstairs, by the way. Who's upstairs editing a brief. Uh, um, but he, he uh, asked an interesting question. So we heard that at some point, y'all got to 103 cases, and I guess only had to chop three. But uh, whether in that process or otherwise, what cases uh, did you two... Uh, have the biggest disagreement over about including or excluding. Ooh, did we disagree much? Yeah, we disagreed about a lot. No, but but we, didn't, we, didn't, we didn't disagree about that. Okay, if you didn't disagree about okay, <laughs> then, then, then let me amend the question and say, what did you disagree about most, then in general, oh. in the process of creating this? Uh, Randy, you go first. Um, well, we wrangled a lot about the scripts. Um, so Josh would do the first draft of the scripts, and he basically based the first draft uh, 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 on the text of the casebook, which I had written um, over the years. Um, uh, but there were times in which his understanding of what he thought these cases were doing is different than my understanding, and we he went back and forth. We were not in the same room. We were doing this all by email or by uh, exchanging uh, texts, uh, like, you know, uh, documents. And uh, we had some very <laughs> long discussions where I tried to convince him that he was interpreting these cases uh, incorrectly. And I won most of those. And it, it, so, it was sort of like a little seminar between him and me, but one private seminar. I didn't win all of them. I, I, my consciousness was raised on, on some matters that I hadn't been familiar with. Um, uh, but that, I think that was the major, and it took a lot. I mean, so this, was a t this used up two summers, which I had actually planned to spend on other projects. Um, dealing with these scripts, uh, and then going into the into the uh, studio, and then when we happen, as a result of having gone back and forth this much, sometimes the scripts that we loaded up onto the teleprompter, uh, once we got them up there and we started reading them out loud, we noticed, wait a second, that's not right. Uh, we sort of let some fact get by, or we had the parties reversed or something, and so we were trying to rewrite them on this prompter, um, and maybe disagreed, disagreed about things like that. So there, there was a lot of that. I have to give Randy credit. Um, his name comes first in the book, so I consider him the senior author without question.
but he listened. Uh, if I didn't agree, he never shut me down. And we had a lot of long debates, uh, primarily about inclusion, right? What to include and what to exclude. And this is David's point about conci concision. How concise was it? You know, this book is 330 something pages. That was not easy. Uh, some of our first drafts of scripts were twice as long. What do you cut? What do you not cut? This is the great books in reverse, right? How do you, how do you distill down? Uh, one substantive point we do disagree on is the police power. Uh, we can have a long debate. If you notice, whenever the police power is the idea that the, that the state has the authority to uh, enact laws to promote the health, welfare, safety, and public morals of the people. And if you ever notice in our book, the word police power always has the word alleged before it or purported or some sort of like, it's, states claim to have this power. There's always these hedging languages, and that's one thing that, that you'll, you'll well, notice. The, 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 where we disagree is about the public morals part of yeah. it, not the health and safety part of it. So that it's health, safety, and they also are alleged to have power over the public morals. There are morals. little hedges, if you read carefully enough, where you see some schisms, but they're, they're, they're buried deeply. Did you consider Shelby County versus Holder the voting rights? Um, we didn't do, well, we have in our case book, Katzenbach against Morgan, which was a related case on voting rights. We did not do Shelby County. The voting rights area is just, it's just so many other doctrines. We just, we, we, I mean, one of the things you have to realize, David, is that uh, with respect to certain topics, this is true of teaching the material in class as well as this. As soon as you raise it, you're really, if you're in for a penny, then you're in for a pound. Yeah. And so if you're not prepared, because you don't have the space or time in class, let's say, to go in all the way, then you really have to avoid it altogether. I thought that one was odd as a matter of the court's reasoning. Uh, Congress in 2006, in the rare thing for the, the Congress in our era, almost unanimously reauthorized the Voting Rights Act. I think it was a unanimous vote in the Senate, almost unanimous in the House, to reauthorize the Voting Rights Act with a special provision that in these southern states is this sort of pre-clearance Remedy. That is to stop cities, counties, or states from making sudden changes in their election laws that would have an effect on minorities. The Supreme Court took it up and struck it down, and Chief Justice Roberts said it violates the, the equal state sovereignty rule. And there is no equal state sovereignty rule in the Constitution. And this was passed under the 15th Amendment, which at that time there were Union troops in the southern states. So there was no assumption of equal state sovereignty. There was the assumption that the federal government sometimes was needed to, to um, and so I thought, wow, it was a big decision. And I, I thought it was very hard to uh, see where did that principle come from? Yeah. Well, some of the state sovereignty principles come from the fact that we are in a post New Deal world where Congress is given a huge amount of power. They don't quite have as much power as law professors say they have, uh, or at least the court hasn't ratified a power, a national problems power, but they effectively exercise something close to a national problems power. And then instead of limiting their powers, they're, they're, the court has restricted their powers by means of either uh, identifying fundamental rights or by identifying suspect classifications of so fundamental rights under the Due Process Clause, suspect classifications under the Equal Protection Clause. So yeah, they can do whatever they want, but they can't do this and they can't do that. As opposed to saying they can't do everything they want. Uh, so Lopez, for example, the Gun-Free School Zone Act was invalidated because it went too far under the Commerce Clause. Because of that, you never had to reach whether it violated the Second Amendment. But most of, when you, when you give Congress an unlimited power, you then have to carve out exceptions. So what happened after the New Deal in the Rehnquist Court is they started carving out an exception for states, like they had carved out for suspect classifications and like they had carved out for fundamental rights. Why? Because if Congress really can regulate anything that's economic, states are engaged in lots of activities that are economic. They're no different than companies when it comes to that. So state, Congress can regulate states. And if Congress can regulate states, then what happens to federalism? Well, because federalism is a first principle, then we have to, we're not gonna repudiate the New Deal framework, but because federalism is first principle within the New Deal framework, we're gonna treat states like we treat suspect classifications, we're gonna treat states like we treat fundamental rights. Because they're special, they have special immunities, sovereign immunities which I agree with you is not in the Constitution, but it's a way of trying to, in a world of second best, bring the outcomes of cases, in this case federalism, back into the picture without repudiating everything that the New Deal, or actually repudiating anything that the New Deal actually did. The court really wrestled with that, though, because uh, National League of Cities was decided, and it didn't last very long before Garcia overruled it. 
So there's a there's a lack of clarity in that area. That's the that's the other Blackman. <laughs> Justice Blackman, no relation. Well, I mean, it's also the 15th Amendment, right, Section 2. Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. What does appropriate mean? You can read lots of things into that. All right, let's open it up uh, to audience questions. Please wait for the microphone. Uh, say your name and affiliation and uh, actually ask a question. Right there, uh, fourth row. It's not, Mike's not on. Mike's not on. No, here we go. Uh, thank you. I'm Leon Weintraub. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, but I am a retired member of the diplomatic service. I'd like to get back to the th theoretical issue of whether the president might uh, initiate a few missile strikes against Iran. Uh, I'm wondering if, in light of the congressional authorization for the use of military f f force, if that could be, if considerably, as I understand it, that justifies a lot of what we're doing in Afghanistan and elsewhere. So they say. Could that, if, if you want to follow that, could that be used to, to justify some, perhaps some smaller strikes against Iran? And is the AUMF completely stretched beyond recognizing the rights of Congress to, to declare war? Well, without uh, commenting on the AUMF, uh, Authorization for Use of Military Force, let me make a general observation about executive power of the kind that uh, David was just mentioning. Um, in, during this administration, more than the previous one, um, uh, you have a lot of uh, uh, press attention uh, to, uh, and po po political attention to decisions that have been made by the president, uh, President Trump, and whether he has ex exceeded uh, his executive authority, and in, in this area and a lot of other areas. And when the press ever comes to me, when one of these stories breaks and it just happens, he proposes something by a tweet or something actually happens, mostly it's the tweet, uh, they come to me and they say, well, does the president have the power to do this under the Constitution? And, uh, or is it illegal? Not under the Constitution, but is this, does he have the power to do it? I said, look, you t first of all, I need to know what statute is he invoking? that gave him discretion to do X, Y, and Z, because you know what? There are ten, tons and tons of statutes on the book that gives the president discretion to do this and discretion to do that. Trade policy, you know, the stuff that he's doing about, you know, saying companies shall not do this or do that. Is that, can he do that? I don't know, tell me what the trade authority, tell me what trade authority he has. What Congress, what has Congress given him by way of discretionary power? And you're almost always going to find that there is a statute and that the president has, act, and is, has actually invoked that statute. Uh, now, there maybe should never have been such a statute, but those statutes were hunky-dory when a different president, when different presidents were in power than when this president is in power. And as soon as this president gets in power and he uses the discretion that he's been given by Congress, all of a sudden, this seems unconstitutional to people. Uh, it may be unconstitutional, but it may not be illegal depending on whether the discretion given by these myriad statutes that I just, and so I can never answer the reporter's question. I don't go on the record, because I say, first I need to know what the statutes are. Usually that's gonna come several days later when we find out what statutes have been invoked. And then we'll look at those statutes. Now Josh, unlike me, on certain issues has actually gone through the statutes to see if the president has this stat authority or that. I typically just move on to the next story. He live tweets the statutes. Right. <laughs> do. So you, have, you wanna say something about that? I will. Um, starting in the 1930s, Congress basically gave away the House. They said, we will give the president whatever authority he wants, <laughs> we don't have to do it. And this was the rise of the modern administrative state. Um, now, that's great when the president's someone you like, and when the president's someone you don't like, it's not so great. Um, and we've seen the last couple of years this, this never-ending stream where the president's relied on statutes that are very broad. And court said, no, 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 you can't do this. Um, in the travel ban litigation, for example, uh, this was about whether the president had the statutory authority to deny entry to certain aliens from Muslim countries. Um, this was a terrible policy, but Congress has given him some pretty big powers. A judge in the Fourth Circuit actually wrote in an opinion that the president's actions would violate the non-delegation doctrine, right? That the president was actually exercising legislative powers. I can't imagine any federal judge, a lower court judge at least, finding a violation of the non-delegation doctrine. But now they did because of the current situation we have now. Uh, my hope is that if any principles endure, 
It's that some future president will allow Congress to scale back the powers given, uh, but I'm opt optimistic. Whether it's Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders or Andrew Yang, whoever it happens to be, uh, the Yang gang's gonna keep the executive power in place. And you actually don't see uh, Democrats who are in opposition to this president really proposing scaling back presidential power. They really do want to go to the microphones and criticize this, that, or the other thing, and even call things illegal and call things unconstitutional. But there's never any serious proposal to revisit any of these statutory grants of discretion to the president because they're going to want to use it when they get around to uh, holding office. Yeah. Right here in the front row. And then we'll go to the third row middle. Uh, Richard Coleman, retired uh, from Customs and Border Protection. Uh, Citizens United, the right to bribe anonymously. How, how, does, how do you square that with any uh, interpretation of free speech? I don't think that's an accurate characterization at all. First off, the court didn't get rid of the disclosure requirements, only Justice Thomas would have. So uh, Citizens United upheld the right uh, of Congress to force people to disclose. Also, the word bribe. There is a distinction between uh, contributing to a campaign versus an independent expenditure. The court said that limitations can be made on contributions. So I, I you know, I, I don't know that that's an accurate characterization. And the facts of Citizen United was that a nonprofit corporation, which is why it made a be, it was a corporation, uh, ran a movie critical of Hillary Clinton that it wanted to run during the election, um, and under the Federal Election Commission rules um, or the or, or the statute, uh, this was barred because it's within 60 days of a, of a camp, of an election. Uh, they could not run a video, a movie that they'd made that was critical of a presidential nomination. Their identity was known, the video was known, um, and then it was a question of whether they had a free speech right to run that video in a political campaign. And so um, I don't think bribe, the word bribe under no circumstances could be applied to the actual facts of that case, which is why Judge Hardiman says facts matter. Middle of the third row, as I said. And then we're going to go to the uh, edge of the fifth row. Thank you. My name is Andy Hawks. I'm an unaffiliated attorney. Could you discuss how a case becomes canonical as opposed to anti canonical? Because it seems to me the jury's still out on a lot of the cases you've included. Yeah. You can take this one. That's true. Um, uh, and, and, and there are cases um, that. Um, are canonical or not, depending on which political view you have. Um, so you would say Roe versus Wade, for example, uh, which is a big case. Um, um, it's sacrosanct for one side, and it's anathema for uh, enigmatic for the other side. Uh, so, the, in other words, its status is c is still being contested. Um, so it's not a super duper precedent. Uh, well, that's super <laughs> duper precedent. It, it, it's an inside joke where pe some people have argued that there are precedents that are so important that they can never be reversed. And that's just a way of just putting a thumb on the scale for the precedents that those people happen to like. Um, I, I think it's a, it's a good question. And that is that um, the, Supreme, the, the, the true subtitle of the, of, the, of the book is 100 Supreme Court cases everyone should know. It isn't 100 canonical cases. Um, it does use the canonical case approach by saying one of the reasons why you should know most of these cases is they're considered canonical. But not every case that we talk about is actually considered canonical. And the direct answer to your question is this is a sociological group-based phenomenon. It's just a matter of attitude. And attitudes can change. So, for example, Lochner is considered anti-canonical. It has been taught as anti-canonical. Uh, this is the bake shop case that was decided by the Supreme Court protecting liberty of contract. It was considered anti-canonical by, by progressives, it, and it was considered anti-canonical by many conservatives. Um, and I think it's, it's, it, it shouldn't be. I think it's actually a great case. And it was well decided uh, the way it should have been decided, uh, and uh, if properly understood. But I can't deny that both left and right think that it's a bad case that you should not emulate. Edge of the fifth row up there. Hi, my name is Zoe Smith. I'm a student at American University. A student, good. 
<laughs> Question for Josh specifically. Yeah. In describing the court cases brought before the present panel, you say that they started strong with cases regarding the Second Amendment and then went downhill when it came to cases such as Obergefell v. Hodges. Why is that and what indicates the transition from up to down? Oh, I wasn't mentioning Obergefell as a downhill. I meant the more Obamacare case was a downhill. Um, he, he said, but he said it that way. Yeah. And I noticed that he said it that way when he said it. This is uh, the kind of thing that we sometimes, this is, this is what would happen in the studio. If something like that would happen, I would say, hey, wait a second. You can't say it that way. Yeah, I, I was so talking about we, John you Roberts. You caught it. Very astute. I was talking about John Roberts. Uh, Chief Justice Roberts came on the scene in, what, 2005 or six as this, like, this, this oracle of the law who had become this, this, this neutral magistrate. And we just, we revered him with it with his piercing blue eyes and his uh, ability to just bat away a question to the confirmation hearing. Um, we had Heller and McDonald, which were, I think, positive developments in the early Roberts court. But then we had cases like the Obamacare decision where John Roberts showed his colors and uh, I didn't like them very much. Uh, and then we have more recently Chief Justice's decision in the census case where uh, I don't know quite what to make of it, but it's very hard to square part one and part two of his opinion. Uh, there's another Obamacare case coming up, and I don't know what John Roberts will do there. Uh, but that, that's what I was referring to, but thank you for the question. Yeah, I'm glad you were, it shows you were paying attention. Very good, thank you. John Roberts is a good, idea, a good guy except for the Obamacare line of cases, is I think what that means. Yeah. Well, no, I, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know if I've ever asked you, Josh, what you actually think of a Burgerfeld, but I think he was wrong there too. Uh, you know, I don't have a problem. Especially invoking Lochner derisively 17 yeah, I, times. I, I think the Roberts ascent in a Burgerfeld is a bit over the top. A bit? Uh, no, I, I think. It's over the top. I think, and this is actually a good way to illustrate it. Um, in a Burgerfeld, Roberts wrote this dissent where he basically compared uh, gay marriage in a Burgerfeld, uh, slavery in Dred Scott, and uh, economic liberty in Lochner. And those cases have virtually nothing in common. Um, and I think his ability to pair slavery with gay marriage was done for rhetorical effect. So here we have this case which everyone thinks is evil, ergo, gay marriage is evil. And I think that that's an analogy that doesn't really hold up. But it's a per that opinion is a perfect example of how the canonical cases approach works in practice, which is here are these terrible cases, Dred Scott, and he thinks also Lochner, which he think he, I think he mentions by name like 16 times yeah. or 14 times in this opinion. 17 uh, not, to be. 17 exact. times in this opinion. Um, so these are the anti-canonical cases. This case is like those cases. Therefore, this case is bad. As though the, just by invoking the anti-canonical cases, that's your argument. It was, that was, now it's not quite fair because there's, there is an argument there, but it's almost a, a ritual incantation of anti-canonical case, anti-canonical case, and you're just like that, just shows how that's how con law lawyers and judges think. Justice Breyer will often cite Lochner in free speech cases. He thinks that uh, laws that use uh, the freedom of speech to, uh, go after various economic regulations are just Lochner re-embodied. So Breyer uses Lochner quite a bit as well. You'll see that, but thank you for the question. Gonna go up there. Uh, David Ralston, retired Department of Defense. Uh, I assume there have been no emoluments cases, but if there were one, uh, <laughs> like one. would it apply only to the president or <laughs> to his family or law firm or whatever. How could you say a word about that? Well, you just happen to have one of the experts on the emoluments clause on the panel, and, uh, it's, and I, it's not me. I, I noticed there were no emoluments cases in your uh, hundred Oh boy, well. where do I start? Okay, well, uh, okay. Uh, the question was about the foreign emoluments clause. There are actually two emoluments clauses. There's a domestic uh, one for the president. Three? There's also the, 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 the relevant here, there are two. Uh, <laughs> Make it more complicated for me. The Saxby fix? I'm yeah, the Saxby fix with Hillary, right? Yeah. She was unconstitutional. Yeah. There was one that says that's the president, and so the one You know, it was a lot easier to be on panels when Roger was moderating them when, when Ilya is moderating <laughs> them. Because Roger didn't throw in a lot of these little asides that, that distract us from our oh, answer. They, but they make it more entertaining. Does anybody think this is more entertaining? <laughs> <laughs> okay. The short answer is that the courts have not ruled on who is covered by the Foreign Emoluments Clause. Uh, I have filed a number of amicus briefs in various courts on behalf of Professor Seth Barrett Tillman in Ireland, uh, and we've taken the position that the Foreign Emoluments Clause, the language, only covers appointed officials and not elected officials. 
Uh, this is a position that's consistent with the practices of George Washington, who accepted many gifts from abroad without going to Congress for consent first. Uh, one federal judge in Maryland uh, has disagreed with us and said that we're wrong. We disagree with him. Uh, and this issue will be litigated. I am doubtful the Supreme Court ever actually takes an emoluments clause case on the merits. If they take it at all, they can probably dump it on uh, various jurisdictional grounds. There might not be standing or not be a cause of action. So I don't know that we'll ever actually get a court to endorse our theory. Uh, but Seth and I have spent a lot of time on this exact topic, and we're uh, uh, we're we're pleased as. And it's no, court. they got uh, Seth got a lot of pushback from law professors. Oh boy, yeah. And uh, yeah. A, and who thought that he was kind of you know making things up and saying things on, uh, that were unfounded, and he's really they, they had to back off. They the the they had to back off. It's just like the, when they criticized the Affordable Care Act, uh, cause of action is frivolous. At the end of the day, it was not. It may have been wrong, but it was certainly not frivolous. And and the same thing is true with with Seth Seth's arguments. But yeah, they apologize, and the historians withdrew their claim against us. They they apologize, so I think I'm in good shape. Uh, that's a, a point I tried to make earlier. I don't know whether Josh is right or wrong, and uh, and I. But I would like the Supreme Court. This is a part of the Constitution. It hasn't been in, invoked, but it's it's sort of an issue now. But it, I do think it's correct to say that if the case gets into the court. The Supreme Court will say, oh, you don't have any standing to object, or, you know, nobody has, and so they will not decide it. So in other words, it's an, another, it's an important provision in the Constitution that the Supreme Court will say nothing about to either clarify what's the reach of the uh, emoluments clause and who's covered. And I think that's an unfortunate development way back where the court has said, we're only going to decide cases, and uh, then there's all the rules of standing all the lawyers would know this, but for the non-lawyers, you'd think, well, how could they not decide those uh, questions? Because it's all, they've got a bunch of jurisdictions that allow them not to decide big constitutional controversies. The name of my first monograph on the Constitution was called Restoring the Lost Constitution. It was not about restoring pre-1937 constitutional law. It was about restoring all the parts of the Constitution that are non-operative anymore because through one device or another, the court has rendered those clauses irre irrelevant and inoperable. And that's the reason why you can't go into court and argue the Ninth Amendment. You can't go into court and argue the Privileges or Immunities Clause. You didn't used to be able to go into court and argue the Second Amendment. There were all these clauses that are lost. And restoring the lost Constitution means restoring the whole Constitution uh, as it was originally designed. I'm going to play a video in the background, but we actually graphically represented Randy's book about restoring the holes in the Constitution. Yeah. This one's good. So there actually are chunks missing from the Constitution, and we bring them back. That's, that's, that's Randy's vision. Roger has a question. This is a question for you, Josh. Uh, when you uh, were up there um, trying to, I'll use the word integrate, uh, the uh, Commerce Clause line of cases from NFIB to um, all the way up to, um, well, actually, NLRB. Or, excuse me, NLRB to NFIB, okay, and, and in between. Uh, did you did you do much of that in your book? Try to integrate lines of cases, yeah. and in the commerce clause line that you spoke about, did you uh, did you um, perhaps give the court too much credit in trying to make sense and square these cases, which, as you know, cannot really be squared. There are. Um, if you have a book, if you turn to page, let's see, 22, which is right there. I'll, I'll just give it to Roger so I can see it. We tried to illustrate, got props. We tried to illustrate as best as we can how the justices shifted their approach to implied powers. Um, what we articulate is it's not just the Commerce Clause. It's the Necessary and Proper Clause. 
the meaning of the word commerce has not changed much since Gibbons against Ogden in the 1820s. It means the exchange or intercourse of goods and services between states. There's an exception about health insurance. We'll get there another time, right? But the, the meaning of commerce has been pretty fixed. What's fluctuated is implied powers. That is, what can Congress do to carry into execution the power of regulating commerce? And in cases like Marbury, I'm sorry, McCulloch v. Maryland, Chief Justice Marshall sort of expanded it and said, if something is perhaps convenient to Congress, they can do it. And in Prigg v. Pennsylvania, when they upheld the Fugitive Slave Act, they said, if it's within the powers of government, then that's fine. The courts will defer. So the question of enumerated powers is not one of doctrine, but one of deference. How much deference does the court give to the congressional branch? And if Congress defers to what the executive wants to do, what the Congress wants to do, then it's basically open season for federal power. And when we describe it, it's what's the role of the courts to say that there are some limits or merely to defer. And that, I think, helps explain the sort of fluctuation of how much deference or lack of deference will be afforded to the court. I'm glad that you raised the necessary and private clauses. That's a point that Randy, in his writings, has brought out. You cannot understand the Commerce Clause unless you integrate it with the necessary and proper cause, because that's where so much is done. And getting back to the earlier exchange I had with David, it is the interpretation of the necessary and proper clause that has fluctuated yes. and which law professors have overlooked in saying, oh, this is commerce clause, this is commerce clause, this is commerce clause, when it isn't actually, it never was. It was necessary and proper clause, and then how do you read that? And, and, and once you plug that back in, then a lot of this stuff starts to make more sense, and you can predict more or less what Justice Scalia was going to do in NFIB based on what he had done in Prince on Necessary and Proper and what he had done in Rach on Necessary and Proper. Um, and though people said there's no way that he could ever vote for us and be consistent with those two previous cases, especially his Rach decision, I knew that that was just not true. I knew that what we were asking him to do was completely consistent with what he had done in Rach. So Josh, to the question, did you perhaps give the court too much credit in trying to integrate this and make sense of what is nonsense? Um, maybe. You know, I think when you make a map, when you draw a map, there are distortions, right? Greenland's not really that big. We could actually take it pretty easily, I think. Um, there it is. Uh, but whenever you try to represent a lot, <laughs> it took a while. <laughs> whenever you're trying to represent a lot of information in a concise form, you have to distort it a little bit. And to paint the history of implied powers in this sort of granular fashion, we have to make a lot of assumptions. In fact, Randy and I agree, this is another place to disagree, I think that McCulloch was pretty broad. Um, I think McCulloch was broader than, when, this little graph over there, how high McCulloch is, we fought over that one for a while. I think I ultimately deferred to Randy. But I think McCulloch was a lot closer to Prigg. I think that McCulloch and Prigg were along the same lines. Uh, but we compromise, so uh, we, 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 we size it in the appropriate fashion. But good question, Roger. Thank you. All right, I think we have time for one more question. Let's go right here. From David Sobles in Washington, D.C. What just made the cut? And what will you leave out in your second edition when there are more important cases that have come down the pike? Want to do it? I don't know the answer. Um, <laughs> well, we've considered for the next edition, do we make it 105 cases? Do we cut things out? We haven't quite decided that yet. Um, I've got a suggestion. Please. You've got two Fisher cases on affirmative action. I would eliminate the first, because the second one actually decided the issue. That's true. Um, counting to 100 wasn't easy. Um, I mean, there's one case that... Well, as Josh already told you, we didn't count to 100. Oh, we, we found that we had 103, and so we could make the title of the book The 100 Cases, because that's what we had. So Wouldn't you be tempted to do another book that, that deals with constitutional cases that are put into the other buckets that you mentioned, like constitutional criminal procedure? I would probably make... Structural constitution, you know, you could... You could divide it into three or four other buckets and put some very important case in there. This is not fun, but I also teach property law, and I might do 100 property cases everyone needs to know. Well, there your are sequel, other cases beyond con law. Your sequel could be 100 more Supreme Court cases. God. Let, let me point out one other thing. The budget 
uh, or the expenditure for this project, the video project, was approximately $100,000. And so what you need is you need, to have, you need a publisher um, who is prepared to front you the money to go into a studio and make all this stuff happen. And uh, that is not an easy thing to do, and it's only likely to happen if you have a market, a, a pretty big market, for a book. So if it's a niche book, um, and you're not going to be able, and the publisher is not going to be able to make back their hundred thousand um, dollars, and this publisher is skeptical about whether it's going to make back its hundred thousand dollars. It's wrong. It's it going to, it's going to make it back. Um, but uh, that's that's a constraint we have. Well, government employees with life tenure don't concern themselves with those <laughs> petty matters. But the hundred thousand dollars should tell everybody in the audience. Uh, including those viewing at home, that there's very high production values of these videos because it was done by a professional uh, video co company, TriVision, who are excellent to work with. Um, and so you're getting a very high quality. Uh, you're not getting a, a production that was done on the cheap, uh, which is one reason why you're going to have to pay for it if you want to see it. It's not going to be on YouTube. It's going to be something you're going to have to pay for to see it. And I should probably mention, um, you, can buy the, you can access the videos in three different ways. One is you buy the paperback. Um, and you will get a access code inside the cover of the paperback that will give you the access to the videos. Secondly, you can go and buy a Kindle edition, or you can go to the publisher and buy their ebook for this is this the retail price of this is $29.95. The ebook is $24.95. That will also give you access to the videos, or um, you can just access the videos only for $19.95. So there's three tiers of which uh, that you can take advantage of. And you can get all these details on conlaw.us, which is the website for the book, conlaw.us. Right now, I should say, for those of you in the room, uh, Amazon is sold out of this book. The demand way exceeded uh, what they expected to have. They're sold out for, we don't know when they're going to get back in stock. So if you want a copy of the book now, you can't just go home and order from Amazon the way you always do when you come to Cato Forum. You really got to go out and snag one of the copies of the books they have here, or you're not going to see one for a while. And if you go to our website, we have the trailers for any video. So you can just pull up and watch a trailer uh, uh, for whatever video you want. We have trailers for all the cases free on YouTube. All right. With that, we're going to conclude. I'll just note that lunch is going to be upstairs on the second level in the George A. Meager Conference Center, up the spiral staircase. There are restrooms on this floor by the elevators and on the way to the lunch uh, on the wall. Uh, with that, we're concluded. Thank you. Thank you so much.